In this video, we're going to talk about hypothesis tests yet again. It will be another example, but this time the alternative is going to be not equals. Previously, we've seen an example with an alternative hypothesis with less than and an alternative hypothesis with greater than. This time is going to be an alternative hypothesis of less than or greater than, i.e. not equals to. So we'll, we'll, we will recall hypothesis tests in general. Then we will talk about the key to calculating p-values when the alternative hypothesis is not equals to. And then last, we'll do an example in R, uh, highlighting an alternative hypothesis example with not equals in it. So let's recall hypothesis tests. Our goal is to use data to evaluate which of two competing hypotheses seems more likely given the evidence we have. And I can figure out how to spell. <laughs> now the question to you all is how close is that to a description of hypothesis testing that I had in just the last video? I hope it should be nearly identical. It should be very similar. So the way we evaluate these hypotheses is state your hypotheses. You have to do this up front before you even look at your data. State your hypotheses with a level of significance. The reason you have to do that before you look at your data is so you don't make a decision about your hypotheses using the only data you have. That essentially is using your data to make your guess and then evaluating your guess based on your data. That seems rather circular. And the only way to avoid that circularity is to state your hypotheses up front. This is part of the reason statistics does not prove things. You need to couple statistics with the theory of your discipline. And when you can craft discipline theoretic based hypotheses and find evidence in favor or against those hypotheses, then you will start to form good scientific practice within your discipline using the tools of statistics. So you've got to state your hypotheses and your level of significance up front. Then go collect data relative to those hypotheses. Then calculate a test statistic. And remember, the hypothesis, the null hypothesis specifically, is part of the test statistic calculation. With your test statistic, calculate a p-value. And with that p-value, you can then decide based on the evidence you have that comes from the data through the test statistic, which of the two hypotheses seems more likely given your evidence. Okay, that was our quick recap of hypothesis testing. Got a pretty big eraser going on right now. Let's shrink that down. And we will jump into the key to calculating p-values in this video specific to the case of not equals to, but in general. Key to p-values is it depends on the alternative hypothesis. Let's just jump to it. I'm just going to say... on H1, because that's our new shorthand for the alternative hypothesis. Options for the alternative hypothesis consist of less than, greater than, or in this video, not equals to. So if H1 is, oops, that's a pretty bad less than, less than, then you're going to calculate a p-value 
relative to your test statistic. I'm going to call it T in this video, and I'll show you why eventually. Relative to your test statistic T, you will calculate area to the left, because that's what the alternative in this scenario says. If, on the other hand, your alternative hypothesis is greater than, then you will calculate area to the right of your test statistic. Because in this scenario, that's what the alternative says to do. And relative to this video, if your alternative hypothesis is not equals to, this one is probably the most difficult, and you get a test statistic t or negative t, you will calculate the area in both tails. And now here's the trick. If you calculate negative t as your test statistic, you're going to calculate the area to the left of negative t and the area to the right of positive t. If you calculate as a test statistic the value t, and t is positive, you will calculate the area to the right of positive t and to the left of negative t. That's probably why this one is the most difficult. So, for the purposes of this video, we're going to focus on this scenario where we are making believe that we have an alternative hypothesis where the mean mu, now here's why I'm using t's instead of z's, because we're going to look at means instead of proportions, the mean is not equal to 93. And that 93 will have context for us in the example coming up. But for now, you'll just go with it. So if we have an alternative hypothesis about a population mean mu not equal to the number 93, then we are going to use the function in R, P, T, because we're interested in probabilities under the curve. And we're going to use the T distribution for the same reason we introduced the T distribution earlier on. When we're estimating means, we simultaneously have to estimate population standard deviations. And because we have to estimate that extra population parameter, we need to take into account the added uncertainty. So we'll use the t distribution with heavier tails. And we're going to use the function pt. Don't forget the degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1, your sample size minus 1. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. There's two things we need to um, pay attention to. We could, in our calculations of our test statistic, get either negative t or positive t. It's easiest mathematically to make negative t equal to positive t or to not operate on positive t. The easiest way to do that is by taking the absolute value of our test statistic. So if we calculate some number and it's negative, taking the absolute value will put us in the right tail, positive t. If, on the other hand, we calculate some positive value, taking the absolute value is going to have no effect on it. So that's not going to be a big issue. But as we have it, this line of code is going to put us in the positive, in the right tail, and then p, functions that start with p, just like functions that start with q, actually calculate on all the area to the left of the input. But we don't want all the area in the left. We want all the area in the right, really. So we can use a similar sort of trick as last time. We can do 1 minus. And if we take all the area under the curve, and we subtract off the value to the left that we don't want, we will successfully get all of this area in the right. But we will have neglected all this area in the left. So the trick is to multiply this entire expression by 2. Because the t distribution is perfectly symmetric, whatever area is in this right tail which we calculated with this inner piece,
we can multiply that right tail by two and pick up all of this. So it's with this two times this difference. Does that make sense, the way I drew that? Two times that difference will pick up all the area in both tails because the t distribution is perfectly symmetric. Okay, so there is our trick to calculating p-values when the alternative hypothesis is not equal to. Let's try an example in R. I'm going to use the same possums data set that I used before. Please go visit my GitHub repository named data and look for the possums data set. We can print out the data set we just read in. I'm going to focus on the variable head length. So in this case, let's um, plot the data. We will load the library ggplot2. ggplot will pass in the data set possum. We have one numerical variable named head length. So I'm going to put that in to the aesthetic. And then you can choose here. There's two options for single numeric variables. I'm going to use a density plot. So what we're going to test is, oh, this is a nice, nice plot here. Not much skew, almost none, maybe a touch left, but really not much skew, very symmetric. Just kind of this odd little bump there, which shows up in real data sets. Nothing to worry about. This is quite nice. We are going to test H naught, the mean mu equal to 93. So is the mean here equal to 93? Against the alternative in R, the way you do not equals is exclamation point equals. Since I can't draw a slash through my equals sign here, I'm going to stick with the R code equivalent. And notice some key facts about these hypotheses. Here, it's about a population parameter. We are interested in making statements about the population. The null hypothesis whoops, almost always has equals in it, as at least as far as this class is going to be concerned. Equals will always be in the null hypothesis. And then you pick a number. I didn't really tell you how I picked that number, but theoretically, based on your discipline, you have some theory that would hypothesize some value which you're going to test uh, if the population parameter of interest is equal to that value. The alternative hypothesis here is not equals to, but relative to the same population parameter and to the same value that you see in the null hypothesis. I'm going to continue with a level of significance of 0.05 because that is one of the most common in the life sciences. So let's calculate a test statistic. Mu hat is just the mean of possum's variable head length. Now let's print out mu hats. You can safely assume that because we got a number here, there are no missing data in the variable head length of the data set possum. That's great. So then we can move on to estimate the population standard deviation. Um, again, we will use the variable head length from the data set possum. We need a sample size because there's no missing data. We can just calculate n by the length of the vector. And then the standard error is sigma hat divided by the square root whoops, of the sample size. So here we are interested in a population mean, mu not a proportion. Because of that, we're going to have to use the t distribution. So I'm going to label my test statistic t as I did in my notes. But it's going to follow the same pattern as before. Start with your estimate of the mean. Subtract off the value you see in the null hypothesis. 
and divide by the standard error. Here we are going to calculate the p-value. That's the area in both tails. Please be super careful about which distribution it is we're using to calculate the area in the tails, though. This is not the distribution we are calculating the area of the tails in. This is not the distribution. This is the estimate of the distribution of the population. But when we calculate this test statistic here, we're implicitly applying the central limit theorem and calculating a p-value based on the sampling distribution of the sample mean, which is a different distribution than the one represented here. That's going to be a key um, point of interest I'm going to look at in your uh, reports as we go through the semester to make sure that you know the difference between the population distribution as represented by some data and the distribution under which we are calculating a p-value. Okay, so we're going to start with the absolute value of t because at this point I haven't looked at the value of t. I don't know if it's positive or negative. I'm going to force it to be positive by taking the absolute value. I'm then going to use the function pt because I'm interested in finding a probability relative to the t distribution. My degrees of freedom are going to be the sample size minus 1. pt, the function, will calculate area for me to the left, but I don't want that. I want area in both tails. So I'm going to find all the area in the right tail and then multiply that by 2. And notice this parenthesis right here. That's crucial because you want to multiply all the area in the right tail by 2, not 2 minus the area in the right tail. Please be super careful with your parentheses here. We got a p-value of 0.25, which, if you're following along and paying good attention, is much greater than our level of significance. If you don't believe me, you can ask your computer. Your p-value is not low, so you fail to reject HO. We are failing to reject HO, saying there is not enough evidence against this to choose the alternative. The null hypothesis seems more likely given the data. The only reason I picked 93 was so we could have an example of failing to reject the null hypothesis. It's best to have an English conclusion of your results. That is just a statement in the language of your discipline. I'm trying to be discipline agnostic here, so we're going to go in plain English. Because fail to reject does not always make sense to your audience. We will say there is insufficient evidence to claim that the mean head length of possums is different than 93. Uh-oh. You guys are calling me out here. Head length is in millimeters. 93 millimeters. This is a rather difficult conclusion because we are failing to reject. We don't want to say the population mean is equal to 93. We don't know if the population mean is equal to 93. We literally don't know if the population mean is equal to 93. We have evidence that the population mean is not different than 93 is what we have found. We have found evidence against the alternative in favor of the null, but we can't claim that the null is true. So I am absolutely going to insist on awkward double negatives like this. There is insufficient evidence to claim the alternative. Insufficient evidence to claim the alternative. Please focus on that language. I don't want to see you all saying that. 
the null hypothesis is true. You should not say the null hypothesis is true ever. We don't know if it's true. The best we can do is claim that it seems more likely given the data we have, and this is the way to write that. So this video actually gave us two examples that I slipped past you without telling you. I advertised this video to say that it was going to be about calculating hypothesis tests for alternatives that are not equals to. But in fact, what I also did was gave you an example of calculating p-values relative to the t distribution. So we had an example with an alternative hypothesis that is not equals to, and in that same example, using the t distribution. You will use the t distribution anytime you're calculating means that are not proportions, because you simultaneously have to estimate the population standard deviation. If you're using proportions, you'll use the normal distribution down here. So hopefully, between the multiple examples you've had in your book and the multiple examples and videos that I've given you, hypothesis testing is starting to make sense. I don't expect it by the end of the week to make complete sense, but by the end of the semester, I'd like you to be more comfortable with this idea. It's going to show up for each next model we look at in this class. So please do take some time to try to understand what's going on now.